So 10 years ago, on this stage, um, I was giving a talk called Coping with the Broken Web. It was a deep dive, a technical deep dive into CSS transitions, and my invest investigation of it, the browser ecosystem, how it implemented that sort of stuff, and then with how I interacted with the CSS working group to, you know, get tests done, fix stuff in the browser and whatever. All the talks that I've given in my life so far have been technical deep dives. Um, I'm one of those guys that just finds the rabbit hole and never gets out of it. This is not going to be that kind of talk. In fact, it's not going to be a technical talk at all. Ten years ago, I just joined Deutsche Telekom. It was a couple months that I was working there. I joined them with the intention of leaving, I don't know, six months, maybe a year after. I didn't manage that, so I totally failed at that. I'm still working for them. Uh, pretty great company to work at. I could talk a very long time of, of, about what I've experienced there, what we did there, our successes, our failures, but I won't, because all of that is kind of boring. As we learned yesterday, at some point, you don't stop caring about technology, but it, it, it becomes less important. You find other things to care about. For this talk, I needed a title. So last week, they sent out an email. I was like, what's your talk going to be about? Do you have a title? Do you have a description? I was like, no. Um, for deck, this picture was the, the thing I was looking at at the time I got that email. I was like, yeah, OK. That's kind of vague enough, but something that can, we can work with. It's a decision-making model um, that Lufthansa and the German Aerospace Center created in the, in the 90s. So this is uh, something that our pilots, the, the commercial pilots, get trained on uh, and do uh, repeatedly throughout a flight. Uh, so often, in fact, that they don't think about this stuff anymore. It's just... You know, that's how their brains have come to operate. Um, there was a fact, like five years ago, the fact was I was working too much. My regular day was nine to seven-ish. I would do my day job, then my wife got home. We would chat a bit, and then around eight or nine to... One, two, three in the night, I would continue working. That was my average day. A Sunday would look like this. It was, I would get up at 10. I would stop working at 10. I would get up at 9. Um, at around 2 or 3, we would have uh, either lunch or uh, you know, coffee with uh, the parents or the in-laws. And then I'd get back on my machine and continue working. Because that was what I did. That was all I did for years. I never really had a problem with that until we were on vacation in Japan. We were walking in Kyoto. Don't really remember what we were walking to, but it doesn't matter. I could not enjoy Kyoto. I was thinking about work all the time. That's when I realized Mm, maybe, maybe I need something. Maybe I need to change something. Um, I, we tried a few things, but nothing really, really worked. Um, my mind was always like computing, doing stuff, wasn't really there in the moment. So I needed an activity that would engage me not only physically, but mentally. And it would do it in a way that if I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing right now, 100% focus, I might not get out of it. So, yes, this is paragliding. Um, 
And that's what I'll be talking about for the next 30 or so minutes. So we're currently in, in Austria. Um, I'm testing a new wing. So this is really just soaring around for a couple hours. Uh, this was my longest flight, two hours in the air. Um, as you can see, the sky was a bit busy. Weather conditions weren't all that great um, for that day, so everyone started or was flying within the same three-hour range uh, in the afternoon. So there were like probably 80, 90, 100 um, gliders in the air. So I wasn't looking for this. Um, I never thought that I, this is something that I could do. Um, by chance, um, the bachelor party my, my friends made, came up with, um, was at a flight school. So instead of walking around Frankfurt trying to sell some, I don't know, whatever you sell, uh, getting drunk, uh, looking ridiculous, we did that. I have really, really great friends. Ever since the 90s, I was 13, um, I was into aviation. And by that I mean I liked planes. I liked flying. I wasn't really super enthusiastic about it, but uh, as, a, as a boy, it was clear to me that I would either do something that dealt with flying, or I would be doing something that was doing something with computers. Unfortunately, I ended up with the computers. Fortunately, I got married and get to enjoy, enjoy this stuff now. So. Um, I'm going to walk you through a couple of things. Uh, we're going to go through what it takes to actually fly, what you need, uh, a bit of theory around all of that. Then we're going to go take a look at a couple of videos um, of me doing a few maneuvers so that you get a feeling for what is actually happening uh, in the air. Right. So we're going to start with the equipment. Um, paragliding is the most affordable way to fly. My first set was about two and a half thousand euros, and that's all you needed from an equipment perspective. Um, you need a wing. That is the thing that keeps you in the air. Uh, there are many different kinds of wings. Um, they are classified into A, B, C, D. Um, the classification is kind of like what uh, characteristics in terms of passive safety a wing exhibits. If it's it, passive safety is if the pilot doesn't do anything. So the wing collapses for whatever reason uh, and the pilot doesn't react, the wing may rotate like 90 degrees or something. If it does only 90 degrees, it's an A wing. It is something suitable for pilots that don't fly very often, for people that learn to fly, etc. If it rotates further, like 180 degrees, it's probably already a, a high B or a C class, and so on. Um, I just bought a new B wing, so I had a, the misfortune that my, my wing just died, the one that I uh, came up with. So that's actually the thing, um, the Niviuk hook that I just ordered last week. Very happy about it. Uh, got to test it uh, earlier this month for a, a whole week. That's the wing that we're going to see all the maneuvers with. Now, you're not attached to the wing directly. You actually have a, a harness. It's basically a backpack that you can sit in. Um, the way you sit in it is very comfortable. So it feels like you're on the couch. There is absolutely no sensation of, of falling out or anything like that. It's like, it's comfy. You can sit in this for hours. At least Germany requires you to wear a helmet. Has to be a special helmet. Uh, has to be certified for aviation. So you can't take your bike helmet or your uh, snowboard helmet. Although people do, unfortunately. Um, 
you need a reserve parachute, also required by law, for all flights above, I think, 100 meters. Uh, you should have gloves. These are um, heating gloves, uh, so they warm the fingers when you're uh, in negative degrees. This is like the only way to not be forced to land because your hands are freezing. You would want a barrier. So th that's a small device, but this, this size. It's the only like sort of instrument that we have in the air. Uh, unlike a plane where you have radar and, and all sorts of stuff, paragliding is more about being closer to nature. So this thing uh, basically tells us our altitude, how fast we're going, where the wind's coming from, how strong that wind is, how long we've been flying. We can program in waypoints because you know there's no roads or anything, but you still want to navigate to somewhere. So you just enter a waypoint and uh, the screen will just show you where you need to go. The wind part is an, an interesting uh, problem. How does this bit of machinery figure out what the wind is? So th th there's no rotor or something that would actually measure wind. It has to be done differently. It's done through GPS. Um, if you sit in your car, you turn the wheel a bit, and you step on it, you're going to do a circle that pretty much looks like that. If you do the same thing in any um, plane, any, anything that is in the air, it's going to look slightly differently. You're still in the same angle of um, rotation, but you're not going to fly a circle, simply because the wind is pushing you away. And this whole uh, put, or this non-circle is what the GPS um, in, in the system, the, the GPS system can figure out. So that's how you f uh, get wind speed and wind direction. It's very, very useful because wind, as we're going to see later, is a very important part of this game. The last piece of equipment that you need is a, a license. So you can't do just do it this in, in Germany. You actually have to... Uh, get a license for it. There are different types of licenses. There's the, the A license, which allows you to fly in one specific area. And there's the B license, which allows you to fly across the country, hundreds of kilometers if you, if you can. Um, I got my B license in, in March this year, so at the end of flight school. Um, Let's take a look at how all of this flying stuff works uh, in the first place. So, like the wings on an airplane, this paraglider um, has an aerodynamic profile, meaning when air flows through it or around it, it will uh, create a higher pressure at the bottom of the wing and a lower pressure at the top of the wing, and that makes it rise to a certain degree because the whole system is actually designed to go down. Um, we're always flying at an angle that uh, goes forward down in order to keep the air pressure within the wing consistent, right? So we need that pressure for the wing to have its form. If we were to lose that pressure, the wing would just collapse and it would be like you have a towel above you for a few seconds. So it usually takes like two seconds for the wing to then inflate again, but the point is, if you're not moving forward, you're not flying. Uh, I, I don't want to go into the, the, the physics of this uh, too much, but there are two important things here. Uh, the one being forward down is a, is a given. The second is the pilot's weight. You might assume that light people have a better time in the air because, I don't know, mass sinks. 
And you'd be wrong. You'd be wrong. So me and my around 70 uh, kilos, actually not doing that well. The heavier you are, the better you glide because the whole system pulling down makes you move forward faster. Going forward faster means you have more um, ascending force. So the ascending force basically cancels out your weight, but you're still going faster. Weight, this is a, a, a sport for people with a bit of a belly ring. The angle of attack, I, I don't know. Normally, I, I like English much better than German, uh, but angle of attack sounds so, so serious, attack. Uh, basically, we're t I'm going to start that again. Um, we're talking about the, the blue arrow um, on your left, the angle that air hits the wing. The single most important job a pilot has is making sure that uh, this angle of attack is, or the wing is in a, a proper position to uh, meet that angle of attack, right? Um, if the wind comes or the air flows from the front, so th the, the angle is too low, then the wing is prone to collapse. If the wind comes from the bottom, so the angle is too high, the wing will stall. So the job of the pilot is to keep the wing in that sweet spot between two very unpleasant experiences. In terms of agility, what can we do with a um, paraglider? Um, a plane has three axes it can, it can rotate on. Uh, in a car, you have one, that's yaw. You can just turn the wheel and that's it. On a bike, you have a combination of yaw and roll, because when you want to do a curve, you also go to the side, kind of just physics. And in the par uh, for, for paragliders, it's a combination of pitch and roll. So we don't have a yaw axis. There is no way to just turn uh, like that. It's always a pitch and roll. However, any angle on those axes cannot be maintained. It's a pendulum. The weight of the pilot will always find equilibrium. The system will find equilibrium. Um, this is going to be um, an, the second most important physics part for the videos later on. So leaving, leaving that, um, paragliding is something you can only do in very specific weather conditions. Uh, you need wind from a certain direction. You need wind to be at a certain speed. So no wind is, is fine, 40 kilometers per hour wind. Too much. Um, I would not take off if the wind is above 25 kilometers per hour. That is simply because our wings are not that fast. So my wing, the wing that I just ordered, has a, a speed range between 22 kilometers minimum and 45 maximum. The trim speed will be at about 35 kilometers per hour. So 35 is not that fast. It's something you could run, not for very long, but 10 meters per second, that would be a 100 meter sprint in 10 seconds. I didn't make that as a kid. It was like 12 something, which is still pretty fast, but it's not that fast. Paragliders aren't that fast. And if the wind is uh, faster than your wing, you have this very unpleasant experience of flying backwards which kind of is a problem. So I'm not going to be able to do uh, meteorology um, in depth, but let's take a look at some of the basic concepts here. Um, how does wind work? Why do we have wind? Um, the sun heats up the ground. The ground heats up the air above it. That makes the air expand, 
So there is less pressure. Less pressure means this air rises to the top. Now we can't have a vacuum, so air has to flow to where the air has risen, which in turn means somewhere air has to sink. And yes, this is a circulation. This doesn't only work with uh, land mass and water. This is different types of land masses, um, same thing. But the point here is wind is the result of two different um, a low and a high pressure area trying to find equilibrium again. So the high pressure will always flow to the low pressure, and that's what we experience as wind. Um, considering we live on the surface, we only experience the wind on the surface, but throughout um, or right above us, the wind situation is fairly different. So at an altitude of, say, two kilometers, wind could be from a different direction. It could be twice as strong. There could be no wind at all. Um, the charts here, that, that's something that is, I, I don't know, I don't, I have a hard time with this stuff. Um, the symbols here represent direction and speed. So that's the direction. We have west wind, because the flags are on the left side. It's west wind. And we got 10 and 5 knots, so 15 knots. Anyone familiar with knots? 28 kilometers per hour. A knot is one nautical mile per hour. So much of the aviation um, stuff is actually from uh, the maritime world, for whatever reason. Um, the wind, we, we don't, usually don't have persistent wind, so we have gusts. You have a base wind of, say, 10 kilometers per hour, and then you have gusts of 15, 20 uh, kilometers per hour. This is also uh, a factor that we have to look at. If that difference is too large, it becomes unmanageable in... Um, when you're in the air. Because a sudden change in wind, as I explained earlier, if the wind, if the air flows horizontally from the front, your wing is just gonna, gonna collapse. So these large changes will make your glider collapse. The second thing that is making up our uh, weather is humidity, is water in the, in the air. How much water can one cubic meter of air hold? Anyone have an idea? That is a very good. It depends on the temperature. So one cubic meter of air at, say, 30 degrees Celsius. Ah. Yeah, don't worry about it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, know either. So it's 30 milliliters. Basically, a shot glass. That's pretty much um, water, considering that we can't see any of it. But the thing is, it depends on the temperature of the air. Uh, the lower the temperature gets, the less water it can hold. Um, by the way, this is what we call relative humidity. So if you uh, at your home you have 50% uh, humidity at, at 20 uh, degrees Celsius, you have, where is that, uh, 8.5 milliliters of water in the air. This is important uh, because, as I explained earlier, um, air rises. If you heat it up, it rises. But as it goes up, it cools down. For every 100 meters, it cools down about one degree. So for a kilometer, it has lost 10 degrees Celsius. That means as it gets higher, it can hold less and less water. And once it's reached the 
100% saturation level, it will condensate, it will create a cloud. And again, clouds, what we perceive from, from the bottom when looking up uh, is usually the area around here. Those are the, the low clouds. This is 11 kilometers up in the sky. Um, what we would like to see for paragliding is pretty much this. There is a very low but present um, cloud cover. That means enough sun gets through to heat up the earth to create thermals, rising air, stuff that we can um, stay in the air. Um, weather models are a bitch. There are multiple of them. They may disagree, and they may disagree uh, dramatically. Um, here we have wind from one direction and wind from the opposite direction. So this means that uh, it happens quite often that we go to a launch site expecting a certain weather condition um, because the forecast told us, and then meeting something completely different. And this is, it feels like magic, really. Um, I know people that uh, can predict the weather very, very well. I can't, so I'm usually one of those walking up the hill, then figuring out that was a bad idea, so walking back down uh, kind of types. But yeah, anyway. Yesterday, uh, when during Basti's uh, talk, I, I got very distracted. I got very distracted. He had this very nice, very beautiful scenery uh, up on screen, and I was like, yeah, I want to fly there. <laughs> that looks amazing. We have a bit of cloud cover, so there must be rising air. That's pretty cool. It doesn't look like we have too much wind going on from the clouds here. That would be, that would be great. I would love to be there. Few moments later, <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe it's good that we're on the ground right now." That picture, there is so much energy in the air, um, you would not survive that. Um, there's a lot of, you know, laws, rules, regulations that we have to adhere to. Uh, not going through all of them, but the Basic, the, the, the core stuff is absolutely no alcohol. It's a criminal offense to fly under the influence of anything. So it's the same rules apply to us as they apply to commercial uh, pilots. Um, you can't just fly anywhere. So with a plane, it's obvious. You have to have a, a, an airport. Uh, with the paraglider, it's not that obvious because you could just walk up any mountain and, and just launch from there. But that's not uh, how it works in Germany. It has to be a registered site. In Austria, however, the landowner has to agree. If they do, have fun. So although within Europe uh, we're all governed by the same core laws, every country still does it very, very differently. Airspace is uh, something that we need to understand because you cannot fly just about everywhere. Um, paragliding is allowed in the G space, the Golf, and the Echo, but we can't enter Charlie. Charlie uh, begins at 3,000 meters, 4,000 meters if you're in the Alps, so air gets very thin there anyway. Uh, not an not a nice place, but this space is restricted to instrumental flight. We don't have any instruments, we can't enter that space. Echo is for instrumental and visual flight. Ground, golf, only visual flight. 
So this is where we are at home. For now, the G space is currently being divided up into something that they call a U space for unmanned drones. Unmanned drones, for drones, uh, aut autonomous drones, right? So the European uh, legislation is currently being drafted for what we will see happening in the next 10, 15 years probably. Uh, you get your Amazon stuff on your doorstep without anyone ever walking up to your house. It's delivered by a drone. And in order for this to work, like drones and paragliders and uh, whatever else is actually going on in, in G-Space, because it's unregulated space, um, especially the drones need to figure out what other participants in the air um, might be an obstacle for them. Because the number one rule of flight is avoid collision. Collision, not a good idea. Um, and the, 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 little, the little machinery that I showed earlier, the Vario, that actually, uh, it's not a transponder like you have in, in, on the plane, which would show up on radar and would identify you. Um, but something similar, just smaller range, right? It's so the Farnet and Flaun. So this would show up, I would show up uh, when I'm in the air on a helicopter screen when it's about two kilometers away, a kilometer away, which doesn't give them too much space to evade, but they have a chance. And the same thing is going to be uh, true for the, for the drones as well. So autonomous drones can see there's something else going on, another drone maybe, um, we need to evade. These um, airspaces, most of these airspaces are pretty fixed. So there's printed maps of that stuff uh, by the ICAO, the uh, International Civil Aviation Organization. And if you can't read any of this, welcome to the club. It's terrible, it's terrible. This is the airspace uh, above Nuremberg. This is a bit uh, better to read. It's a digital um, visualization that we would actually have available to us in the air, if we so choose. Um, thing here is, above Nuremberg, there's like no flying at all. That space allows you to fly between 383 meters above sea level, that's ground, to about a kilometer. That's all the space you get to fly. The red area is restricted because the uh, transponder mandatory zone. We don't have any transponders. We don't show up on radar. We may not enter this area. Above that, we're in um, Charlie. So, sea airspace. Nuremberg wouldn't be the place I'd like to move to if I wanted to keep paragliding. So enough of the um, theoretic stuff. Let's take a look at some, some videos. How do we actually get in the air? We launch. Uh, there are multiple ways to launch. This is a reverse launch. It's the preferred way to launch with a bit of uh, wind because you can see the paraglider coming up, you can react to it, you see if there's anything wrong with it and, and stop. Love that. Uh, if there's too much wind or much wind, more wind, then um, reverse launching isn't the best idea. Um, for that we launch Cobra which is called like that because it looks like a snake or something. This is my, my, my first um, Cobra launch, so it's not exactly pretty. By the way, all of these videos are uh, from one or the other um, training exercise. So it's not like any of this is like done perfectly. Lots of stuff going wrong here. 
Um, the idea behind the Cobra is that we uh, launch in that yellow area. So we pull up the wing in the yellow and green area where there is wind and pressure, but it's not that much. If we were to pull it up in the red area, it would drag us uh, away. And by drag us, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about it, it pulls you horizontally. The forces at play with enough wind are... Um, insane. The other thing you might have noticed uh, with the Cobra launch, I didn't run off a mountain. I got pulled up by a winch. So this is um, about two hours north of Berlin, Waren an der Müritz. That's where my flight school lives. Uh, once a year we go there to um, get our winch training. If you came up flying in the Alps, like just walking off mountains, this is going to be a terrifying way to launch. If you came up with the winch, if that was how you got to paraglide in the first place, walking off a mountain is going to kill you. So it's always an interesting uh, situation when, when these two types of pilots uh, meet in the other um, space. And if there is no wind or wind from the, from the back, um, you need to run, run, run. So we tend to launch forward because that's easier to just pick up speed. When we're in the air, uh, at some point we want to go down, landing. Some people are afraid of this. Uh, here is a very soft landing. It's almost like... <laughs> if it looks boring and if it looks like the pilot is bored, it's probably good. If it looks exciting <laughs> and the pilot is doing crazy things, probably dangerous. So anyway, that was, like, that was the, the, the final, final descent. I just wanted to show the touchdown that this is like... Easy. Uh, how do you actually get to uh, the place you, you want to land? This is uh, in, in Italy, uh, like three weeks ago, uh, when we were on a training run. All of this area is landable. I can land anywhere here. And this is about 150 meters. That's 100 meters. That's 100 meters. So this, this area is huge. But the point is, that's where you want to land, at that point. So about 100 meters, 150 meters uh, off, you uh, do your, that, that's your position. That's where you do like circles until you have a height that would mean a 45 degree angle to that point. That's when you leave your position, fly away at about a 30 degree angle. You then turn at a 10 degree angle. You then turn again. That's the final approach. And that's what you look like when you realize your angles were off. And that's what it looks like if you uh, if, if you break just a bit too much. So in your final descent, the glider rides, rises again. But anyway, so basics, um, flying. There are a couple of maneuvers that you uh, need to go through um, to get your license. We train this stuff um, in order to get a better control of the wing. This is called an eight which is not an eight at all. It's just two circles in, in opposite directions. Um, the idea here, again, it looks boring, right? It doesn't look fast or anything. And um, it ends in the same direction that it started. That's kind of the, the key idea here, that without being a pendulum, you end on the same uh, axis that you started. The pilot view of this 
will show that it's a bit more work than just you know going, I'm going left now, I'm going right now. At about 90 degrees turn, you release the brakes and you pull it again. By that, you make the glider come forward just a tiny bit so that when you pull the brake again, there is more energy going into the rotation. The video that we saw earlier with the, with the wind, the angle of attack, um, the nodding exercise is... Um, oh, that was totally wrong. Nodding doesn't have anything to do with that. <laughs> this is just pitch. But as you can see, um, there's no way to maintain that. You always uh, swing back through. At the very end here, that's at the, the actual point of the um, exercise. Can I go back there? That thing. Stopping the wing above you, immediately above you. That is the uh, important part here. Um, that's something we learned very, very early on um, because situations may come up. That's a friend of mine, unfortunately, uh, the only thing I couldn't show myself. I'm not going to show anything super dangerous, but uh, he was trying to stop the wing, but there was so much energy um, built up by his very short stall that he couldn't. He couldn't manage to uh, like break all the way. If he hadn't braked at all, it might have been possible for the wing to go below him and him falling into the wing, which is like the nightmare scenario. That's usually lights out. So that's why this whole nodding and, and stopping the wing uh, immediately above you is such an important um, maneuver, even if it looks like it's like, ah, oh, we're having fun on the swing, right? kids. Mm. The point is stopping. Uh, we saw the pitch axis. Now this is the roll axis and this is um, a bit of a lie because it's always a combination of roll and pitch. Um, this is very intensive rolling. This is what we call wing overs. When am I done? Now. Okay, so that was it. Um, again, I have the, the pilot's view of that. Um, if you get motion sickness or something from large moving areas, this would be uh, a good 30 uh, seconds to take a look at the floor or the ceiling. So you have very small... Um, Impulses here. There we are at 135 degrees. I was so proud of that until we did the uh, video review. I mean, w this is a training exercise, so all of this was filmed and analyzed in, in the evening, and they totally destroyed me. Because <laughs> the, the wing, you won't notice, and I barely noticed, the wing was like a, a minute shy of collapsing, which is not a great idea if it is below you. Anyway, so what, what's happening here? Uh, we're doing a turn, and we get to about 30 degrees. That energy, uh, the, the wing will then go a bit forward, so we dive. Using that energy, uh, we can swing up to 60 degrees. Just by uh, pulling the brakes when we're at the very bottom, it will translate this pendulum energy and it will just shoot us higher. We do the same thing again, 
timed properly, we're at 90 degrees. Um, and if you're crazy enough, 135 degrees. And that's where it ends in Germany. You can't go, you, you may not go higher because then it would be acrobatic flying, which is not allowed in Germany. Fortunately, we were in Italy, so didn't break any laws. It's an ex insane experience. Um, the thing here is this only works because it's a pendulum. The, the momentum that you build up, that allows you to go up. And in theory, if you build up enough energy, you could go around and do a barrel roll. Probably not the way I built up that energy. You would have to come out of a... Um, I'll do that later. I'll do that later. Uh, let's get to the, to the stuff that you don't want to have. Collapses. Um, my time's up, really? Crazy. I'm going to keep going, though. Um, so this is something that we train explicitly. Um, if we didn't manage to keep our wing in that sweet spot uh, and, and the wing collapses, this is a 50% collapse, it still flies. I mean, it sinks a bit uh, faster, but it's still flyable. Um, if you don't manage to uh, get a grip on the wing, you'll fall into a spiral. So this was in, a, um, in an SIV, a safety training, uh, last year. The pilot actually flies backwards in this. So the, the, the point of rotation moves between the wing and the pilot. That's a very, very strange um, sensation. This is one of the things that usually precedes a crash. People, uh, the pilot did not manage to stabilize the wing, fell into the spiral, could not get out of the spiral, which what this maneuver was all about, uh, and then hit the ground. Um, incidentally, exactly the reason why I wanted to train this uh, how do I get out of this if I fail to stabilize in the first place? Now, that was a 50% uh, collapse, a side collapse. Uh, this is killing the entire wing. Uh, grab the front row so I can pull it down. Before I do that, I use the speed system. This is maximum speed and goodbye. You wouldn't have noticed, but there was a dirty movement. I did this, pulling down, going back up. I shouldn't be doing that, yet I always do that. Um, this is dangerous because it will go right. Um, if, if, you, if you stay there, you'll pull your wing into a, a stall. And the stall is a very different kind of beast uh, to a front collapse. The collapse, as you might have noticed, it was about two seconds. So the wing was gone, it wasn't flying anymore, two seconds, it was back. I didn't really do anything except uh, bring my hands up. So we train this stuff because it happens in um, real life, as it did here in the Dolomites. We would just warming up for um, our SIV, our safety training in, in Austria earlier this year. We're just having fun. This is the only video uh, I'm going to show with sound because the wind noise, the beeping, me narr narrating the problems I'm having. So we're just having fun. Uh, I'm in a, in a thermal, spiraling upwards. You can hear the beeping, which is announcing that I'm gaining altitude. Uh, it's a beautiful scenery. And bam. You saw me doing that again. I pulled the wing into a stall. Whoa. And I'm, whoa. And again, 75% collapse. I'm just going to let this run until... 
Alter. Puh. Puh, ich will... Ich will landen. I wanna land. So if you train this stuff, it's, it's fine, right? You, you expect the wing to collapse because you're pulling it down to collapse. You're prepared for what comes next. But if it happens while just flying normally, the adrenaline that pumps through you is crazy. So when you need to get down fast, or faster, you can uh, do what we call ears, which is simply reduce uh, your wingspan. So you will sink at, instead of about a, a meter per second, what is the normal sink rate, you'll have like three to five meters per second. And if the paraglider behind you uh, gets too high, you just open the wings again, because you don't want to go below. If you like need to go to the bathroom uh, quickly. The B stall will get you there in in eight to six to eight meters per second. It's important to exhale before you pull down, because this is like pull-ups. This is an insane uh, amount of force you have to put into uh, the system. You're basically turning your paraglider, which, is, which wants to go forward, into a parachute, which just goes down. You kill the aerodynamic profile. And if you really, really, really need to go to the bathroom, you can manage that in 20 meters per second downward in what we call a spiral. So I'm basically flying downward at the moment. So I'm still going forward, but forward is now down. Um, in this maneuver, let's take a look at it from, from that perspective. Again, uh, motion sickness. If you have a problem, look somewhere else. Um, at this point, when the, when the wing goes uh, forward right now, I'm experiencing about four, maybe five Gs. So there's a lot of energy uh, in that. Um, fortunately, we don't have to experience that in, on the air, in the air for the first time, because everyone like blacks out at different um, forces. This is a G-force trainer. Uh, again, we did this uh, an hour north of, of Berlin. It goes up to 7G. So I, I just watched uh, Maverick this week, and it was like, the F-18's airframe, the, the stress limit of the F-18's airframe is 7.5 Gs. So that's about the uh, force that a fighter pilot can exhibit. Um, and it's no joke. It really is no joke. Hurrying up. Uh, I said we don't have a yaw. I lied. You can do a negative rotation. So that's basically stalling one side of your wing. The other one still flies forward. One goes backward. Not something you want to do for very long. If you stall one side and then immediately stall the other side, you can do something else that I lied about. You can fly backwards. So that's the back fly. And we're back in normal flight. Um, this is stuff that we only train in, in SIVs, um, simulation of incidents in flight. At least the French version, that's the V is French en vol. Anyway, uh, we do this above water with a life vest uh, and a rescue boat in the water because things go, may go wrong. And if they do, it looks a bit like this. That's, what, that's a rescue, um, the reserve parachute. 
So when your primary wing collapses, this was the last flight with that wing. So it, it knew that, I didn't, it knew that, and it came to hug me goodbye. Sink rate here was about 1.4 meters per second. That's about what I would exhibit if I jumped off the stage here. That's from one meter to the ground, jump off, that's about a meter something per second. Not that bad. Fun fact, um, my head and right shoulder stayed above water at all times. I don't know. So I'm, I'm like 10 minutes over, 11 minutes over. You want to come to the end? The end is... <laughs> the end is here. All of this training really just leads to understanding the wing, controlling the wing properly uh, so that you can be as safe a pilot in the air as, as possible, right? But the goal here is to hang loose, to enjoy, to get away from everyone and everything, <coughs> to reset your brain, or in this case, my brain. Have a drink. And that's it. <laughs>